Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, Fading Memories listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. I have a very interesting topic for you today. With me is Rena Yudkowski. I think I got most of that right. And she's going to be talking all about memory. Like, why do we walk into a room and immediately forget why we came in there? And I know a lot of people who panic when that happens because they think, oh, no, here it comes. So thanks for joining me, Rena. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I should say that I am in California and Rena is in Israel. So I just finished breakfast and she just finished dinner. So <laughs> yeah. if, I'm not, if I'm not my bright and perky self, it's because I have not woken up my brain completely yet. So. I always need a good workout to get the blood flowing in the brain. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about you and what you do, and then we'll talk about memory. Okay, great. So I am a geriatric social worker and memory coach, and I put everything online right before COVID about three and a half years ago. So it's called Memory Matters. So I'm the CEO of Memory Matters, and I was teaching these memory improvement courses live here in Israel. And then I just decided I want to go digital. I want to go online and really reach a lot more people all over the world. And then COVID happened. So all the <laughs> seniors in the whole world that were never online were now online because they had to be. It was their lifeline for everything. And all the senior groups closed their doors and needed programming online. So I could sit here in Israel and I could be doing webinars for senior groups in England and Passaic, New Jersey and Jerusalem all on the same day if I wanted. So in that way, COVID was, I guess, pretty good for me. Um, I also am able just to reach more people and help more people with, you know, with the advent of Zoom and everyone getting on Zoom. I can even do one-on-one -on -one memory coaching with people all over the world. So that's pretty amazing. Um, my background before that was I was a, um, I was the head of an Alzheimer's unit in an assisted living facility when I lived in America. And then over the years that I've been living here in Israel, which is 20 plus years, I've been doing a lot of interesting things in the field. And one of them is really learning about memory. I took a course from a cognitive psychologist all about memory. And it was sort of like an outgrowth of working with people with different types of dementias that just made me like think and wonder, like, how does memory work and how does it and like, why does it not work? And it's such a fascinating topic. So that's sort of how I got into it. You know, I always I always loved working in the nursing homes and the, with seniors and I pursued a degree in it. And then um, I've been doing a lot of interesting things in the field here. So, yes, I was teaching the memory course live and then put it online. And then I, I went to put my course online, but ended up with a lot more than that, doing these webinars for senior groups and developing a membership. And maybe I'll talk more about that at the end. That's sort of how I got into it and what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been using Zoom since the fall of 2018. And many of my guests are older than the two of us. Mm -hmm. And the best part about the pandemic is I stopped having issues with the older um, as one of my older guests called herself a tech klutz. Mm -hmm. And all of those issues miraculously went away after the co after COVID hit. And yeah. all of the authors that I had to kind of chase down a little bit to to book all came after me. So, wow. you know, there was some positives. There's always a silver lining, although yes. COVID, I mean, we've learned a lot from COVID. It's still terrible, but, you know, yeah. at least, at least it's, at least it wasn't horrible a hundred percent of the way so nice. i know well my my husband has a trick you get up from your desk and you walk into another room and immediately forget why you came there a gal he used to work for said why is it when we go back into our office and immediately as we sit down we remember what we wanted she says i have a trick for for remembering what you want without having to go back and sit at your desk and then get up again because as soon as you forget what it was you came into the room for or whatever you're doing, grab your buns because that simulates sitting back down and somehow stimulates remembering why you came in the room. I haven't tried that. I usually stop. Like, why was I walking over here? Three, two, one. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if um, you recall or if we even talked about with um, when we spoke before is my Eternal great grandmother, mm -hmm. my grandmother, and my mom all had some form of dementia. So, you know, wow. it'd be very easy to go into panic mode yes. every time I forget something. But usually it's because you're 
you're not paying a hundred percent of attention. You know, you get up from lunch, you put your dishes in the dishwasher, you're going to go over here and take care of this and this. And then you're like, wait a minute, what was I doing? It's just because your mind is going in multiple directions. At least that's what I've learned, but I know a lot of exactly. people panic. So what should yeah. we do when we walk into the kitchen and open the fridge and go, what was I looking for again? Exactly. Okay. That's exactly what we're going to do today. I have some really good techniques. So let's first start with the panic piece. So where does our mind go automatically? We sort of have this pre-programmed script when we can't forget, we, we panic, we get all uptight and we go, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? Am I getting dementia? I'm so stupid. I'm too old for this. And then the, <laughs> the negativity. Well, what's the chance you're going to remember if you do that? Not pretty, much. Pretty slim. Yeah. So we need to, first of all, the first thing you do when you can't remember something is deep breath. Your brain needs oxygen. And then another deep breath. Your brain needs oxygen. We need to calm the nervous system down. You have a much better chance of remembering when your nervous system is calmer and your brain has oxygen. So always the very first step is take a few deep breaths. And then you want to change that self-talk. That self-talk needs to say something like, I got this, or um, it's going to come to me, or slow it down a little and I'll remember, or I have the tools and techniques I need because Rena taught it to me. <laughs> I tell people after I teach them all the tools, I'm like, just pull the tool out of the tool bag. You'll be so much more empowered. So that's about the self-talk. And the self-talk is very important because if you say to me, if Jennifer, you say to me, Rena, I can't remember your name. You cannot remember my name. There's no chance you will. If you have that, even if you have the thought, I will not remember this person's name, you have a very small chance of remembering it because you convinced yourself of that. Right? The saying is, whether you believe you can or you believe you cannot, you are right. So if you say to yourself, oh, Rena Yukowski, okay, I'm going to use some trick and technique and tip that Rena's going to teach me to remember that name. I got it. That's very different than I'm never going to remember your name. I won't even try. Right? That is true. So what we say to ourselves, like Jim Quick says, our, our brains are supercomputer and our self-talk is the program it runs on. I love that because... What we feed our brain, I can remember or I can't remember, is going to exactly be the self-fulfilling prophecy. So if all day I'm saying, I can't remember anything, there's something wrong with me, I'm getting dementia. Now, if there's something serious going on, I'm not saying to deny it. Go check it out. Get a memory assessment. But what we tell ourselves when we just have like a senior moment is going to really feed how well our brains work for us. So the first thing we're doing is breathing. The second thing we're doing is we are changing our self-talk. The script needs to be gentler, calmer, and softer, and more positive. Because that's, if we say to ourselves, I got this, I'm going to give myself some time, it'll come back to me, just take a deep breath. That is very different than the other script. So that's really, really important. Okay, so whether you believe you can or you can't, you are right. That is true. And then, yeah, and then like you said, attention. So my, um, one of the, my favorite webinars that I love to do for, I've done this for dozens of senior groups. It's called, what did I come to the fridge for? And it's four techniques to improve focus and memory. And like you said, what happens? I, I have the thought, I need the milk from the fridge. I walk towards the fridge and what happens? My mind goes to at least 10 other things till I get to the fridge. I open the fridge and I say, now, what did I come here for? Is that memory? It's not a memory problem. I, my, I had internal distraction. Now it might've been external distraction. Maybe my kid called me, maybe my phone rang, maybe the doorbell rings. That would be an external distraction. And then when I go to the fridge, I'm like, what did I come here for? Cause I opened the door, answer the phone in the middle, right? <laughs> yep. So we got totally distracted and we live in a very distracted world. Very. <laughs> yeah. So phone's so I get to pinging the fridge. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I get to the fridge. I'm like, what did I come here for? It's not a memory problem. It is a attention and focus issue. So I, here's the quick solution to this. And it sounds silly, but it works. When I have the thought, I need the milk from the fridge. I'm going to keep saying, as I walk to the fridge, I'm going to say milk, 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 milk. And then when I open the fridge, it's not what did I come here for? It's like milk. It sounds so silly, but what are you doing? You're keeping yourself focused on one task. And that's really the first technique for a focus. It's stop multitasking. Yeah. We are multitasking to the wazoo these days, right? If you are not on your phone and typing an email and trying to drive all at the same time, you know, then you're not productive. We need to get rid of the multitasking thing. It is dangerous to talk while you are driving on a phone, even if it's on speakerphone. It's like driving mm -hmm. while drunk, okay? 
it's really dangerous. Our minds cannot actually do two things at once. Our minds are what's called a sequential processor. So we take in information and we process it quickly, but one thing after another, not exactly at the same nanosecond. So you think you can do those tasks at once, but you really, really can't. And what are you doing? You're tripping up your brain. So when you try to write an email while talking to your, your kid or while talking on the phone, where's your brain? All over the place. <laughs> exactly. Not focused on either of those tasks. So multitasking is tripping up our brains. It's making us feel stressed. You know that feeling of like trying to drive and listen to someone on the phone tell you something and then and then the car in front of you stops short and you're like, oh no, and you can't really focus on all that. That's why it's really dangerous. They say that cell phone talkers are half a second slower to step on the brakes. Half a second is a big deal when you're talking about, you know, if the cars are this close together. Yeah. So- <laughs> So we really have to stop the multitasking. It also, it makes us less creative. It temporarily lowers our IQ by 15 points. Multitasking Ooh. temporarily lowers your IQ by 15 points. So we got to get rid of that notion that if we do a lot of things at once, we're more productive. And I don't know if you're noticing, but as we get older, it gets harder to pay attention to more than one thing at a time. But that doesn't mean that we can't be, produ be as productive. We can be. It just has to be a bit we have to do things differently. When we're younger, we shouldn't multitask either. We just get away with it, quote unquote, <laughs> because we think we can. But you know, my our sister brain, called me one our day. Our brains sister, process faster. Yeah. Sorry, our brains yeah. process faster. And there was, and I'm going to link it in the show notes if I can find it. But the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, Maria Shriver's Foundation, had a mm -hmm. whole article on how multitasking is actually it impacts your brain negative negatively. Yeah. Ugh, still early yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. There's so a lot ahead. of research on that, a lot of research. So one day my sister, who's about 10 years older than me, called me and said, there's something wrong with my memory. And I said, and I know that she multitasks like crazy. I said, when you stop multitasking, call me back. And she said, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm too busy. <laughs> I'm too busy to stop multitasking. And I said, then I'm telling you right now, that is why you are experiencing memory issues or why you think you're experiencing memory issues because you are trying to do too many things at once. Um, so as much as we think we're more productive as we do many things at once, we're really, really not. And if we would focus on task one and get task one done and then focus on task two and get task two done, et cetera, et cetera, at the end of the day, we will have accomplished so much more than starting, stopping, starting, stopping, or like think of, think of when your computer has like 10 windows open and you switch back and forth, that's multitasking. And when you do that, you're wasting fractions of seconds switching back and forth. But every time you come back to the other window, you have to, where was I on this window, right? And we all do it and we're used to it, but it's not good for our brains. So that's really, really important. Um, that's really important. Now th there are times in your life where I get it. I know you can't stop multitasking. You might have a deadline. You might be in the kitchen cooking and you need to talk to someone, but you know what? Then you're going to say to me, I forgot to put in the sugar or did I put in the salt? And that's why. So that's not a memory issue. And that's what I want to explain to people. Really, really, the first thing you need to do when you feel your memory, if, if you know something's starting to happen, I want you to pay attention and ask yourself when, when you forget something, like you go to the fridge or you can't find your keys or whatever. I want you to ask yourself, did I even pay attention to the fact that I put my keys down in the first place? And usually the answer is going to be no. And if the answer is no, then it's not a memory issue. Now, if you do all the techniques that I teach and then you still have issues, then there might be something more serious going on. Um, I always encourage people, if you're worried about your memory or someone else is worried about your memory, go get it checked out. Go to a geriatric doctor. Go to a neurologist. You can contact me. I do memory assessments. And let's see if there's something more serious. But always say to yourself, stop and say to yourself, did I even pay attention to this in the first place? Because oftentimes we expect ourselves to remember things that were not encoded. They're not even in long-term memory properly because we didn't pay attention to it. So that's a really, really important point about focus and attention. Which, you know, when you come, come in the door from running errands or whatever you're doing, it's very easy to, you know, throw your coat down. Exactly. Maybe put your keys in your pocket, throw your coat down, then later you hang the coat up and now you can't find your keys. I am a huge, huge proponent. I am very super highly organized because it just makes life easier. Yes is everything has to have a specific place. Yes. And if it's, for me, if it's not in one of two places, it's generally because somebody else in this house has moved them. <laughs> I always Which he's say that. Not my, to do. 
I always say that my calendar, which is my life, I write everything down, is, is on the desk in front of me that you can't see. And I do not move it from there. I never move it from there because I, I never lose my calendar because my whole life's in there. I cannot afford to lose it. <laughs> so, and, and I'm still pen and paper, old fashioned. Um, I do not move it from here. And my children know that they may not move my calendar ever. <laughs> Upon like my, penalty of death. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say that, but I didn't want to be so strong. <laughs> you said it for me, Jennifer. <laughs> well, my exactly. husband is very good about dealing with clutter. Like, these are things I have to deal with. So he sticks them in a, we call it his little hidey hole. <laughs> and months down the road, he'll be like, I need to clean out this hidey hole. And he'll start, pull- oh, yeah, I was going to do it. It's like, oh, my gosh, it makes me insane. Yeah. Because it's yeah. like, dude, if you just didn't stick it in the hidey hole, you would have dealt with that thing four months ago instead of now it's a big deal. Or yeah. you would have not replaced that cable because now you know where it is. Like, er, we had that issue when we came back from our, our Rose Bowl trip. I had taken the uh, phone cable out of my car and put it in his car so that I had one in the car and one in our trailer. The one in the trailer. And I had been sick. I'd managed to get like bronchitis, a sinus infection, right. and a cold all in December. Oh. So my focus wasn't as good. And we had gotten in my car and he's like, no cable. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. And I try it because like my phone's plugged in now to use as the webcam. I try not to have it plugged in all the time for battery, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, I've only been in the car twice. I could have sworn at least once I had the cable, but maybe I didn't because I know I didn't plug in my phone last time. And so I started questioning him. Um, Is it still in your vehicle? Is it in the cubby between the seats in your vehicle? And he got really mad because he was like, thought I was accusing him of moving my stuff because that's been a problem in the past. And Mm -hmm. he kept saying, check the bags that you had. I'm like, I had my camera bag and my purse. It's not in either of these bags. Where is it? Turned out it was in his bag. (laughs) (laughs) So why does that happen? It happens because... You, he, he put it there, I'm assuming, without paying any attention. His mind was elsewhere. He was either on the phone, which is a huge distraction, or he was thinking about something else or doing something else. So we this is about where mindfulness comes in. If we are really present when we put those keys down, and I'm going to give you a few other tips for that as well. But if you are present and mindful when you are doing different tasks, you're going to remember that you did it later. But what our mind is like, well, a lot of us are ADD. And our minds are trying to do a lot of things at once and we get very distracted. So it's about being present. So for example, when you eat breakfast, if you're reading the newspaper or scrolling your phone on Facebook or LinkedIn, you might not remember what you ate later. And is that a memory issue? Not necessarily. You were not paying attention to what you were eating. And I would even say you weren't enjoying what you were eating. And I would even say you ate probably too much because you weren't paying attention to what you were eating. So this is where mindfulness can help memory. It's being present, mindful. So when my kid's talking to me, if I'm doing something else, I might not remember what they were saying, but not because I have a bad memory because I really wasn't paying attention to them. So if they, they know, if they want my attention, I cannot be in, write, in the middle of writing an email. I cannot be on the phone. I cannot be doing anything. If they know if they want me to remember what they're saying, they got to be in front of me. I got to be mindful. I got to be looking them in the eye and paying attention to them. Now we can't always be mindful, but, if you want to remember something, try mindfulness to help you. It's a great, it's really being present. It's, I always, I do it like this, bring your brain to where your body is. Cause sometimes my body is here and my brain is in Honolulu thinking about <laughs> whatever. So I got to bring my brain and my body to the same place. We got to align, align your brain and body. And that's mindfulness. So that's also really helpful. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do mindfulness and Um, And then I want to also talk about those keys again. Another technique for keys. Okay, so now how are we going to remember where we put our keys? So first of all, mental images. Mental images are very powerful. Our mind thinks in pictures. So when I put those keys on my coffee table, what am I going to do? I'm not just going to put them down and walk away while I'm talking on the phone anymore, right? I'm not multitasking anymore, so I'm not on the phone. I'm going to, when I put them down, I'm going to imagine a bomb blowing up on my coffee table. Or I'm going to imagine a huge bouquet of a hundred red roses popping out of my keys on my coffee table. So in an hour, two hours, I say, where did I put my keys? This image comes right into my head. 
a huge bouquet of 100 red roses. Why did I say 100? You want to exaggerate it. You want that image to be sharp and colorful and beautiful and special or funny and absurd because you remember that. Or a bomb blowing up. If it's violent, you might also remember it. I don't like the bomb blowing up image, but it's what the books say. So I say it for those of you that it works. So you're making a mental image that's strong when you put your, it could be your keys, your glasses, your phone, anything you want to remember. And then that image comes back to you if it's absurd, funny, vivid, action-packed. So that's really, really a great one to remember where you put things, even where you parked your car, right? We park in a garage and we have no idea where we parked our car. It's because you are not paying attention to where you parked and you were probably on the phone when you parked. So when you park your car, let's say you're on level 3B in the parking garage. I would imagine three huge bees buzzing around my car. I would just have this picture in my head. Might even close my eyes and do it for two seconds. Three huge bees buzzing around my car. So when I come back into the garage and I go, now where is my car? Boom, this image of three huge bees buzzing around my car comes to mind. So that's a really fun, creative way to do it. See, I like those creative things because I am very artistic. Mm -hmm. The other problem with parking garages is when you're leaving, you're going, say, north. And when you're coming back in, you're going south. So it's almost like a mirror image. So it doesn't look like you're like most people would be like, let me visualize, like, let me take a mental snapshot of my car. And they skip all the cute, fun stuff that helps you remember. Mm -hmm. When you're coming back, it doesn't look like that picture in your mind. And then you can't find your car and you go into panic because you think, oh, my gosh, my brain is going like, oh, no, I'm the fourth generation with dementia. And oh, or somebody stole my car or blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Um, I have an interesting car story. I went to the community college was like, I don't know, a few blocks away from the mall. I was in college in the 80s when malls were still a thing. Mm -hmm. And I drove somebody to the mall to drop them off to work, went in, did something, went back out, went to class, drove back to the mall. Maybe it was for my own job. I don't remember why, but I parked in a completely different spot. So when Mm -hmm. I came back, left the second time, I literally went into panic mode and I was minutes away from calling the, at least the mall security, if not the city police, because I was convinced somebody had stolen my my crappy car. (laughs) And then Fortunately, I was young enough, my brain, sorry, my brain remembered that I'd been there twice and I was like, oh yeah, it's on the other side of the building. Ooh, embarrassing. (laughs) So I was really glad I didn't call the police. I think we've all been through this. These garages are really confusing, um, especially malls that have a lot of, um, you know, entrances and can be very confusing. The parking lots are huge. Whether it's a parking lot or a garage, I find the garage is even more confusing than the parking lots. Um, What I tell people to do in the parking lots, let's say a Walmart, Target, something like that, where it's a big lot. When you get out of your car, stand and look where you are in relation to the front of the, the entrance to the store. So, and count, I'm three lanes over to the left and then count spots and I'm 20 spots back. So when you come out of the store, you look and you go, oh, okay. Now you have to go this way, three lanes and 20 spots up. So, and, and if that's, and, and visualize it, like you say, visualize it. Um, if that's too hard, you could take a picture. You can always, if you're in a garage and you get like one of those little, you know, tickets, you can write on the back of the ticket 3B or 4B or 20 lanes back or whatever. So you can use, um, we can always use technology like using our phone to take pictures to help us, but we want to be able to remember things with our minds as well. So that's where mental images come in and they can be very powerful. And I do in my courses that I teach, I, I do a lot with, we do a couple different exercises with mental images and it's fun. People love it. There's one more technique I want to share that's really helpful and practical that people love. They come back and tell me all the time that this works. So it's called using your senses, okay? Use your senses. Senses stimulate your brain. The more senses you use to encode a memory, the the easier it's going to be to remember. So if you use one memory to encode, one sense to encode a memory, you have about a 10% chance of remembering it a week later. If you use four senses to encode a memory, you have about a 97% chance of remembering it. So how do we do this? How do we, how do we use our senses to encode a memory? So let's take, for example, locking the door. A lot of people say they, they close the door, they lock it, and then they an hour, 10 minutes later, even an hour later, oh my gosh, I don't know if I lock my door. This happens to a lot of people. Again, it's a lot because of distraction. If you're on the, if you're on the phone, when you leave your house, you're going to have no idea if you locked your door, right? Because you were in the middle of a conversation. Your brain wasn't in conversation. Your brain was not aligned with your hand locking the door. Okay, back to that. 
So here's how we do this example. Um, I'm not on the phone anymore because I'm not multitasking. So when I leave the house, I'm going to take my key and I'm going to feel it. Just This takes two seconds. I'm going to talk it out, but it really takes two seconds. I'm going to feel the key. Is it hot or cold? I'm going to look at it. What color is on the, on the ring, on the you know keychain ring? I'm going to watch my hand. Now I'm going to watch my hand. I'm using my senses. I'm watching my hand turn the key. I'm going to hear the click of the lock. I'm going to hear myself shut the door. I'm using my auditory, my vision, and then, and feeling, that's tactile. Okay, smell and taste doesn't apply to this example. <laughs> and don't then, lick the door. <laughs> no, don't lick the key either. Too many germs on it. Um, and now when you finish locking the door, you say out loud, I have now locked my door. I have now locked my door. So you walk away, you go on, you do whatever you need to do. And then a couple of minutes or an hour later, you say, did I lock my door? Yes. I remember feeling the key in my hand. I remember watching my hand turn the key. I remember hearing the door shut. And I remember saying out loud, I have now locked the door. This really works because you're using your senses to encode that memory. You're not just walking away and not paying attention. We're paying attention. And this only takes two or three seconds to do this. And it's so simple and it really works. I'll tell you a story from one of my students that told me how this worked. I taught this and she, she said every night she would go upstairs to her room and she would inevitably come back downstairs to check the door because she couldn't remember if she left. And this was happening every night and it was driving her crazy. She's like, I can't keep doing this. I taught her this technique. She did it. She sent me an email saying it worked. I did not have to go back and check my door tonight. And she was, she was so excited. It was like a quality of life issue. Every night I have to go back downstairs to check the door because she couldn't remember whether she locked it. So for her, it, was, it sounds like a silly example, but for her, it was really a quality of life issue. She wanted to be able to remember that she locked the door. I mean, it's simple. And this simple practical technique really helped her. So that, that was really, and, and people love this. And the other ways you could use it, you could use it to remember that you took your medicine, that you turned off the stove. These are big ones for people, even with like MCI, right? With mild cognitive impairment, they need some tips and techniques to help them remember that they did it, to make sure that they did it, um, to, that you made appointments, um, anything really that you want to remember. And even where you put things. So the same thing, let's go back to the example with the keys. I'm putting my keys down on the coffee table, okay? I'm watching my hand put them down. I'm hearing the click of the keys on the coffee table. I'm saying out loud, I have now put the keys on the coffee table. So in an hour when I wanna go, I'm like, where are my keys? It's like, oh yeah, I remember hearing the click of them. I remember watching my hand drop them. I remember saying out loud, I have put my keys on the coffee table. Really simple, really practical, it really works. <laughs> I believe it and we have a, um keypad for our mm -hmm. front door lock. I mean, we could still use a key, but nowadays with cars, with the fobs where you just touch right. the handle. Right. Keyless entry. I, yeah. I love it. It's like, yeah. I don't have to dig in the pocket in my purse to pull out the keys when you're juggling whatever it is you've purchased or, you know, the groceries or whatever. Yeah. So when we moved, I told my husband, cause we had talked about one of those keyless entries because who wants to take their keys when they're walking the dogs and right. You know, not that it's, you know, it's really not that necessary when we're where we live to take mm -hmm. keys, you know, lock the doors when, um, you know, we go out to walk the dogs. But, you know, you want you don't want to get out, out of the habit of not locking doors, right. which um, I kind of had because just busy and doing a lot of things. But I noticed that we have more of the did we lock the door questions because you basically hit one button and yeah. then psh, off you go. But I always listen for the me mechanical, the noise that it makes when it yeah. turns the deadbolt. And yes. my husband's got a little bit of hearing loss in one ear, or actually kind of a lot of hearing loss in one ear. So I don't think he hears it as well. Mm -hmm. And he is always double checking the lock. So I'm going to tell him, feel the keypad, yeah. listen for the, the noise, and, yeah. you know, like look at it for half a second so that you yeah. know that you did it. Because the other thing he forgets and... It's got to be because he's multitasking is he forgets to close the freaking garage door Yeah. sometimes. And he parks in the driveway. So he has no need to be going in and out of the garage. Like I pull out of the garage and you know, yeah. we've got a Peloton, we've got road bikes, you know, yeah. it's a safe neighborhood, yeah. but stuff says stuff has still happened. So it really, yeah. it really frustrates me. It's like, dude, there's things yeah. in the garage. I would really not like to just make it easy for somebody to steal. So right. Right. <laughs> I don't yeah, have I to harass him about not multitasking while you're pulling out of the driveway. <laughs> now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, 
we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, yeah. And um, you could even you could even put um, like a little note on the garage door that he might say, remember to lock it, or did you lock the garage door, or something like that, like a note that he'll see in his rear view mirror if he's pulling out. Um, something like that, like a... a like an external cue, an external uh, reminder. But yeah, it's very important. Say it out loud. I have now locked the door. I have now shut the garage door. I have now turned off the stove. I've now taken my medicine. When you say it out loud, first of all, you're doing something that's going to help you remember. And the auditory, you're using your senses. So you're going to remember hearing yourself say it. So it's very powerful, very easy. And you can do this with so many different examples. And it really works. So using your senses stimulates the brain. It turns it on. Um, it makes it just much easier to remember. And it's also helping you give it attention. So it's just giving the couple seconds of attention by doing this that really makes a difference. That makes sense. I have a, a hormonal replacement medicine. I take one tablet at night. I mm -hmm. swear, probably five days out of seven, I'm like, did I take that? It's because I'm not paying attention. Like yeah. partly because I'm kind of tired. Mm -hmm. But I'm also doing the other end of the day before bed routine. So yeah. I'm going to I'm going to start saying I took it yeah. out loud because yes. I really yeah. hate getting all comfy, cozy in bed and then going, did I take that? I, I and know. then there was one night I remembered at like four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, forget it. I'll just take it in the morning. And there must be a reason you take it at night because I didn't feel and I use the word normal. I was like mm -hmm. a lot groggier. So yeah. Like, I'm not sure yeah. I want to take this at you know, breakfast time again. I don't know right, if it was actually right. a correlation or not, but it's like, let's just remember to take it at night. Yeah. <laughs> you could check it off. You could have by your night table, just like a little chart that when you take it, you check it off. Um, that's another way of using your senses. You're actually doing, again, you're doing an action. When you check it off, you also can always look back and see that you did it. You could have a pill box. If the pill box is empty, it's not there. You know, you took it. Um, other simple techniques like that also work. Um, yeah, so this is, these are some of the, some of the techniques from my, I do like a whole webinar for senior groups. So I just gave you two out of four of the techniques for, um, improving focus. Well, I think between, like I said earlier, phones dinging, like yeah. my husband's a real estate broker. He could get up and at breakfast, tell me I'm going to do bump, 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 these four tasks, these four tasks got to get done today. And by dinner time, those four tasks have been trashed and he's done seven other tasks because that's right. just the, you know, I always thought, um, cause I, I'm a retired portrait photographer and booking appointments mm -hmm. with realtors was a giant headache. It was like yeah. herding cats, you know, they'd, <laughs> they'd be late, they'd call and reschedule. And it was just, it was constantly juggling yeah. And, you know, I tried to be very accommodating because that's what you have to do. And, you know, I would want somebody to do that for me. But, oh, my God, it was so right. crazy. And right. when he switched from banking to real estate, I was like, okay, well, they're not all flakes. <laughs> they're not all dis disorganized messes. It's just really the industry. But, yeah. you know, yeah. I've, I've, you know, he's been doing it for uh, almost 20 years. Wow. And, yeah, it's like I had to do the math. And it's early for math. <laughs> so, you know, there's days when I'm like, you know, he'll be like, I really, really need to do X. And then the phone rings. And as you may be aware, California had like a month of just constant, like, 
I'm not even sure I can describe how hard it rained for a month. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. Almost biblical kind of rain after, you know, five years of very little rain. Wow. And so, of course, this means we've got trees falling down and fences falling yeah. down and roof leaks and other other problems that Mother Nature exasperates. So, you know, he's just running around putting out fires. And wow. I've counseled him a lot. You gotta, you gotta just sometimes just say this hour from X to Y, I'm not touching my phone. I'm turning off, you know, I'm turning right. off the ringer, turning off the emails. I'm not paying attention. I got to get this, whatever done. Cause you know, you just sometimes have to make the time to focus on a task that needs right. to get done before it's, you know, so overdue that you have to right. like do it in a big fat rush. So we have a couple minutes I yeah. have always, my entire life, been notoriously horrible with names. The okay. only way I remember somebody's name is to look at them and say, that's Raina. And, you know, she's the memory coach, for lack of a better term. Like, we were in a Rotary Club of 100 people. And when we'd get a new member, I'd be like, that's Raina. Every week, I'd look, I'd say the name, and watch where the person would sit. So that when I ran into them at the grocery store or wherever... I could pull their name out of their hat. But as a photographer, I would I literally had a family of five come in one day and mom said, you know, I'm Jennifer, this is John, this is Laura, um, Paul, and Miranda. It's like family member names. By the time yeah. we circle back to mom, totally forgot her name. And I was paying attention, but I think my brain was in like creative mode, like, okay, yeah. I'm looking at them physically. Exactly. Oh, it just okay. it was so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this, Okay. So you are not alone. Most people come to a memory course because they want to remember names. And I actually, that is part of my full signature course. And I actually pulled out the names piece and made a separate masterclass because people really wanted just names. So I'm going to give you, so it's, I have like a two-part masterclass on this, but I'm going to give you the first part of the technique. And this, this will be helpful for a lot of names. And you meet someone new, you want to repeat the name back to them in conversation. So um, if it's a new name, you know, you might want to say, oh, what does that mean? Like Rena, you probably don't know what Rena means. Rena is Hebrew and it means joy. So what I always do is I, <clears throat> I jump in the air. I go, Rena's jumping for joy. You can't really see me doing that in the screen, but I jump in the air and I say, I'm jumping for joy. Rena means joy. And that gives you a mental image. It gives you what my name means. So, um, so you want to ask them, what does it mean? Or, oh, that's my sister's name. You comment on the name. If it's a name you have never heard, you say that. Um, and then you want to repeat it back to them in a the conversation. So it goes like this. Hi, Jennifer. It's so nice to meet you. Jennifer, where are you from? <laughs> I'm from California. <laughs> oh, you're Jennifer, you're from California. Um, what part of California are you from, Jennifer? Northern California. Oh, it's so nice to meet you, Jennifer. I just said your name five times. Now, it might have sounded exaggerated because that was a very quick conversation, but let's say you have a couple minute conversation, repeat the name back to them. Again, based on everything we just said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it stick here. Why? Because you're giving it more attention and you're hearing yourself say the name. So putting together everything we just learned, we're giving it attention by saying the name again, we're repeating it out loud, we're hearing say it, and I'm being mindful. I'm looking at you and I'm saying, Jennifer, and I'm saying it a few times back to you. So repeat the name back to the person in the conversation a couple times. That alone is going to help you with a lot of names. Then we go on to the fancier techniques of association and associating the name to the face and what does it mean and da 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 da. We do all that in my course and in my master class. But the very first thing, which is very easy to do and to remember, is when you meet someone new, repeat it back to them. Hi Jennifer, it's so nice to meet you. And whatever the conversation is, just keep saying Jennifer. You know, you don't have to do it so it's like exaggerated, but it, you have a much higher chance of remembering it if you just repeat the name back a few times. That makes sense. And I believe yeah. with this one particular family, I think when she introduced each person, we're talking five people in probably under 10 seconds. So that was yeah, that's problem one. Um, I think I looked at each person and said, oh, you know, mom, dad, child one, two, and three, like mm -hmm. their names. And literally by the time I got back to mom, yeah. I was like, I'm not even going to ask this woman what her name is. She just told me this is so embarrassing. And it's almost was at the time almost easier to refer to whoever I was talking to as their relationship. Mom moved to the left a smidgen right. or mom, can you cuddle right. dad a little bit? 
because that just, especially when it's a family portrait, it made, it was almost made more sense and it was much easier for me. <laughs> I, I would just, I would have done that. I would have not let her introduce me to five people in 10 seconds. I would have said, wait, wait, mom, your name is Sarah. Okay. What's, and then next kid is John. Hi, John. Nice to meet you. How old are you, John? I just said it twice. I would, I would slow it down. And if you really want to remember, say each kid, look at them and say the name. Otherwise, if introduce five people and come right back around, there's no way that's sticking. You can't encode that that fast. Okay, good. So it's not just my brain. No, I always dis- no. I always felt it was because I'm super visual. You know, I, I'm a photographer. I like to read. I'm very creative. I make handmade greeting cards for fun. Mm-hmm. Um, those are so those are all visual and a little bit tactile. And I just always assumed it was just that's how my brain works. And I'm not going to remember names when you blurt them all out and a quick succession, or even if it's just, you know, like meeting somebody new, I literally do have to repeat their name to myself in my head multiple times. Now I remember to say just, it out loud. So just that'll do it probably out loud help. Now. That way do I don't have loud. to ask, ask my husband, what was that guy's name again? <laughs> yeah. Cause that's very I'm- embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, you know what, next time I do the, you name a masterclass, I'll let you know. <laughs> Cause that's, it's a live, I do it live on zoom, but you it's, might enjoy that. It's, it's really lot- fun. Oh, I'm sure it is. It's a lot easier these days because I'm not in big groups as often. Yeah, right. Um, I right. try to change that because, you know, <laughs> having done everything on Zoom for the last three years and, yeah. you know, then we moved. It's like in the pandemic, it's like my social life, like really shrank yeah. to almost nothing. And we're working yeah. on it. But oh, my goodness, it's just it's I, I started a card making club in our community. Wow. And I'm about to start making these gals wear name tags because there's a bunch of them, you know, five or six, or the first night was 12. It was like, I'm not remembering anybody's names. Too many of you. <laughs> so first of all, you know, you're not, you're going to say something different. Now you're going to say, yes, I can remember all your names. We're going to do it like this. And you can put on name tags and you can, you're going to repeat the name back to them. That's the first part of the technique. Then there's the rest where you can remember them. It's, you just have to practice the technique. Well, there's one gal. I'm pretty sure I could remember. I could put her name to her face because we were working on Valentine's cards this month as we're recording January 31st, 2023. Can't believe this month is already over. Yeah. And she was like, I'm going to make, can I make a card for a friend? I got a birth, a friend with a birthday coming. I'm like, oh yeah. So here's the pieces, parts that I have for making a birthday card. And then she was talking about how now she's setting the bar up high for these other friends. And she hopes their birthdays are not too close together because she's going to have to make these cards and her name is the same as my daughter. So it's like, now same? I have like this whole story, but That's it's all great. visual too. So yeah. That's fantastic. That is how you do it. Your brain can hold on to that because it's visual and because you have a good picture. Like we said before, just, the mental images. Yep. That's me. So where can people find out about all your courses and these fun classes and all the good yeah. stuff? Thank you. So I have a website. It's renaukowski.com. It's my, it's my name, renaukowski.com. Um, and on there, I, I usually have whatever's going on live, whatever offers live. So whether it's my course, which the full course is 14 sessions and I teach that live, which I'm in the middle of doing now, or my master classes, um, or I have something automated called remembership. It's a membership to help you remember remembership. And, um, and that's really fun because that's automated short videos and brain exercise that you can do when you want. So it's super convenient, super like small little chunks to work on your brain and memory. And then that has a live coaching call with it once a month. So there is a live component where you can hop on and ask my ask questions to me. So that's a really fun offer. It's called a membership. And I usually, again, you can get to everything from my website. Um, I'm also on, I have a Facebook group for those of you on Facebook. I try to post that every day. It's called Memory Matters, Tips and Tricks for Midlifers and Seniors. I'm also on LinkedIn, TikTok, and Instagram. So can pretty much get to all my links from my website. <laughs> and I always link the website in the show notes so people don't have to, <laughs> they don't have to remember and they don't have to guess how to spell your last name. <laughs> right. That's the hard part, spelling. Yeah. So no excuses. Just click mm-hmm. the hot link in the show notes and it takes you right there. And you can have all the good stuff that she just mentioned. So I appreciate this. I know it's after dinner for Raina. It's time for me to go do my workout so that my brain is a little bit more awake, although it's pretty yes. awake now that we've had this great conversation. <laughs> thank and you. You're welcome. So thank you so much. And I'll be talking to you soon, guys. Thanks so much. 
Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.